Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we are extremely lucky to be joined by Professor John Hawley. John, can you give us a little bit of a background about who you are and what you do? All right, I'll be brief. Um, I am a British citizen, grew up in New Zealand, went to Loughborough University in the United Kingdom for my first undergraduate degree in human biology and sports science, studied with David Costell in the US for my graduate training, then went to Tim Noakes' lab in Cape Town, South Africa, did my PhD and postdoc, arrived in Australia 20 years ago, had a position at RMIT, and then my group was headhunted to come to ACU, where I now am the director of the Mary MacKillop Institute for Health and also the program manager for the Exercise and Nutrition Research Group, which wasn't very brief. <laughs> Well, it's impressive nonetheless. I think one of the things that we were really excited about was that someone with your level of knowledge was willing to come on and, and share what they know, um, which is extensive to say the least. So we do very much appreciate it, John. Um, you mentioned a few different things there. And, and one of the key things that we always talk about in terms of knowledge gain is going to different parts of the world because they view things differently. So can you actually, you know, you mentioned it in your little bio there. Can you give us an idea of, you know, how you think being based in different universities across the world has actually shaped the way you, you view knowledge? Because one thing that we've noticed speaking with people that do come from different parts of the world is they actually see, you know, research, they see knowledge gain in different ways and they kind of approach it in different, in different ways. So can you maybe share a little bit about how you've, that you've viewed that yourself? I think it's a really, really important point you make. And just for example, if I look around out of my office window here, I think we've got 20 people in my group and I think I've got two local people and one of those is from New Zealand, if you want to call New Zealand local. So my lab is full of overseas people and I'll be honest, if I have two applicants who apply and they've got the same credentials and one's a local and overseas, I mean, unfortunately, I will take the overseas person because A, they come, as you say, with a different background of research experience, but B, I think they add to the sort of the international flavor of the lab and that perspective actually rubs off on on different students. So if you take it back to my case there, yeah, I, I studied in, you know, three different continents simply because they were the leaders in my field. And if you want to be the best in your field, it's, you know, like a soccer game, you play the best teams in the world and you get better at it. So it wasn't really a choice for me at the time in New Zealand. Um, and I remember actually having this discussion with with uh, the late Peter Snell, who, as you probably know, was a triple Olympic gold medalist for New yeah. Zealand, but also yeah. an exercise physiologist at the University of Southwestern Texas. Yeah. And he said to me, John, he said at the time, I was said, Peter, where should I study? I want to stay here. I could go to Otago. I could do this. He said, there is no one to talk to. You must go overseas. And I still <laughs> remember that conversation. <laughs> And a, and a truer word wasn't spoken. He said, look, these are the people in the field. He'd worked at Loughborough. He'd worked in the States. He said, go overseas, get experience, and then come back with that knowledge and the different experience that you'll gain from that. And they were probably the, the best words of advice I, I ever had from anyone. And, and again, your point is very valid. I, my message to students would be broaden your horizons. Definitely come back to Australia. It's a great place, but go overseas first and get some experience. Yeah, we've been experiencing that quite a bit where, you know, Australia, obviously, because of its separation, you know, Australia, New Zealand, their separation from a lot of the world has very insular views at times and, and doesn't want to mm -hmm. listen to other people, which I think is very disappointing because, as you just said, you can learn so much if you are willing to go out and, um, you know, experience a different way of approaching a problem or seeing the world. And, and that, that is really useful, I think. I think it is. And again, you, you make a good point there. We are isolated into whatever you want to call it. You know, the nearest place we can get to in the States is Los Angeles, and that's 14 hours away. And, you know, I, I'm lucky. And to some extent, the people in my lab are lucky that we, we do get to travel and go to conferences and the such like. And, and they're an important mixer as well. And we can talk about the networking and that sort of thing later. But I, I, I do think it's essential, given that we are so insular, that we don't literally become you know very narrow sighted and very tunnel vision because that's easy to do and you can see that and probably going to talk out of turn here but with our grant reviewing process you know we've got a very small panel of people who review our arc and nhmrc grants and you're going to come up against rivals colleagues and the such like where 
you know, in the States, you, you've got a much wider pool. You've got a greater pool of experience and the such like. So, again, it comes back to your first point, get out and then come back. <laughs> from from your experience, John, of studying in different areas of the world and gaining knowledge and different perspectives, how do you approach some of the challenges of trying to communicate some of your ideas and knowledge to colleagues here in Australia who may have a certain perspective of how they approach a particular problem or view a particular area of research? Yeah, look, there's, that's a good question and probably a hard one to answer. I mean, my guys, again, I'm talking about the people in our lab and, and people in other labs. The best way to do that is to network and collaborate. And, you know, we're lucky mm. in that because I've had so many, you know, overseas gigs, as it were, we've got a lot of collaborations in just almost any any part of the world. And I, I guess one point here is, at least in the, you know, the ex nutrition field, you've got to remember worldwide, it's a very small pool. Mm. So, you know, if I were, if you were to offend someone, the chances are I would know who they are. I could pick up the phone and say, well, look, hold on, you know, <laughs> you don't want to talk to these guys. It is a very small world. And I'm always telling my people that, you know, don't offend anyone, always make good links, collaborate. Uh, and that's the way to go. The other thing is, you mentioned earlier, Australia being very insular, that applies to funding as well. We have a very small yeah. pool of funding and exercise just isn't taken seriously. In fact, in some of my grants, I don't even write the word exercise anymore. Mm. I put contraction or the such like, because the clinicians for the most part and other people just aren't that interested. I don't think they realize the benefits of exercise and we don't need to talk about those because Obviously, the three of us are very aware of that, but that's another big problem. So when we go overseas, we're always trying to foster international collaborations, do studies. You know, the, the studies that we do for the most part are very small in the numbers. And if we can get uh, multi-center trials going or someone else in another country to add another 20 subjects, then all the better and the data is all the better for it. So it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's it's not one well, post-COVID, we can overcome it now. We were, we were locked in for a couple of years, which didn't help things, of course. But um, that that's my sort of roundabout answer to that question. But it's a good question. I know like we're talking a lot, obviously, about this, the networking, the soft skills. But I know that you actually did some papers and collaborated with Will Hopkins. And um, I saw that there was a, you know, there was a few years back, there was a big blow up with the statistical analysis of, you know, <laughs> The MBI and um, I think it was is it Saini from from is it Stanford and she was not happy that, with the approach and yeah. they were going back and forth in these <laughs> papers and it really from the outside being someone who just was consuming this literature it looked very childish to be honest with you um, <laughs> and what was interesting is by the end they actually ended up coming to the part where they started doing papers together being like okay actually how do we fix this problem. With someone with yeah. your experience, like how do you get to that point a lot earlier than going tit for tat in, you know, uh, research papers or, you know, then commenting back and then there's a reply and, and it, it seems yeah. it seems like, you know, a bunch of grade fours arguing in the in the, in the kindergarten. <laughs> I won't tell Will Hopkins that, but um, look, he's a bit of a grump- he's a bit of a grumpy old man these days, anyway. But um, he won't mind me saying that. Look, the the problem is sometimes you work in an area, and your if you like your life's invested in that area, so you become very dogmatic. And I'm mm. going to give you an example, and and I don't say this lightly because he was my mentor and supervisor. I worked with Professor Tim Noakes in Cape Town. Yeah, I was going to ask for, you about this. You know. Okay, well, well, we might as well go there now. <laughs> it's going to come up anyway. Um, and, it, and it is an example, and I will then directly answer your question. But yeah, yeah. at the time I was in Cape Town, you know, Tim was always said, you know, we mustn't be dogmatic. We must take another views and this, that, the other. And then the, the irony and the paradox now is he's become so insular and dogmatic in his views that it's hard to actually accept some of them. And we'll leave that, you know, for a later question mm. perhaps. But in reference to Will, again, you've got, You've got a person there who's invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of it for free. You've got to remember that he's all the stat stuff that he's done has been publicly available and he's never sought any financial reward and this, that, the other. So I like your analogy of you know, the four-year-olds fighting in the kindergarten or whatever it was. But I, I, I'll give you an example. I've just come back pre-Christmas from a, Chile, a conference in Chile in San Diego. Luke Van Loon was there, who you know probably, and Keith Barr was there. Yep. And... They're looking, and I'll be very brief here, they're studying collagen synthesis and this, that, and the other, and they've got views which are diametrically opposite. Mm. So mm. Keith, 
has taken himself to Luke's lab in Maastricht for a year's sabbatical to try and sort out why they get such different results. That's mm. how science should be that's, done. Uh, that yeah, is that, a that's a awesome. great example. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it doesn't happen Enough. all the time, of course, no. as you know. Yeah. So... I the, the Will Hopkins thing, yes, there was a lot of public discourse. And then, as you said, in the end, they reach a common ground. It's like any extreme I say to my students is dangerous. Too much, too thin, too fat, too much religion, too little. The pendulum eventually comes back. And I think that's what they've done in the stats argument. Can I ask you this then? Because I have this, I'm a disagreeable person in general, right? But I actually think <laughs> okay. that it's a really useful trait because I'm not, upset if someone disagrees with me because that's how I slant anyway. And one of the things yeah. that I think is useful about it is, and I, I try and say this to younger people now because we, we live in a bit of a homogenous kind of society, particularly intellectually, where if you oppose something, people think, you know, you're a curmudgeon or a pain in the ass or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's really important that if you are on those opposite ends, it actually creates more discussion, but you can't shy away from the discomfort of someone having such a different view to you. And the example you just gave there of kids, both like rather than being like this person's wrong or they're stupid because they're getting a diametrically opposed position, say, okay, can you explain to me how you arrived there? Because I'm coming at it this way. And to me, yep. as a disagreeable person, I actually see that as being a really fun experience. Now, I know people who are agreeable hate that experience because they're like, why won't you agree with me? But do you, do you try and educate, you know, your, you know, I'm sure you've got lots of postdoc students and, and things like that that come and work in your lab to actually embrace that feeling? Because now in society, I believe that that feeling people run from. Yeah, it's an interesting analogy. I mean, I, I, I give you a silly example, you know, polarizing views. If you take the American political situation at the now, I, you, you know, you look at the, the far right and you look at Trump and this, that and the other. And, you know, would you engage in a, an intellectual scientific discussion with a moron? And the chances are, no, you probably wouldn't. So polarizing views are good up to a certain point of view. But if they're not backed by science, that's my bottom line. You know, you've got to have a scientific stand. You can't just say I'm anti-vax or I don't believe in this or I don't believe in that. If you do, show me the data. Yeah. Then we can engage in in a, a discourse which has you know an intellectual level and a scientific basis. But you know if you're just ranting and raving and and you know you're on your soapbox and you've got nothing to back it up, then to be honest, I haven't got the time to waste with you. But I agree with what you're saying. You know, polarizing views, and I, I guess I <laughs> keep taking it back to Tim Noakes, but that's a good example. You know the the high fat, the ketogenic diet, yeah. it's extreme and it's caused a lot of discussion. You know, Louise Burke and guys from my lab have just had the article in MedSci Sports, you know, opposite views and this, that, the other, trying to reconcile well, them, although they didn't do that. Yeah, you can. For, for, no, for our listeners, can you explain a little bit about why it's such a polarizing, you know, dietary kind of recommendation, what it is exactly, and then and yeah. maybe talk about, okay, is it useful in any situation? Is it useful in some situation? Is it useful in no situations? You know, you're you're the person obviously right. that can evaluate the science on this. Yeah, there was about four questions in one there, yeah, but I'll apologize. try and go through them systematically. Apologize. So, for the, for the listeners here, I mean, there's this again diverse polarizing view of you're either in the carbohydrate camp or the fat camp, which is again not how it works because, as you guys know, when you're exercising and you're doing whatever exercise intensity, you're generally burning a mixture of the two fuels. So there's the camp which says a high fat diet, ketogenic diet is very beneficial for endurance performance. And there's the camp that is mainly us who have said that, yes, up to a point you can use fat, but in most events, uh, under three or four hours, carbohydrate is the predominant fuel, fuel. And we have, you know, numerous studies to back that up. We've done, look, here's, here's my logic on this. And again, I'm bringing in, you know, Louise Burke, who as you probably know, is my wife anyway, but we've spent six, seven, eight years trying to look at fat adaptation and high fat diets. And trust me, if there's any benefit to performance, particularly when Louise was working at the Australian Institute of Sport, we'd be using it with athletes. Yeah, I, We cannot find it at all. It, it isn't there. I, I went to a conference, uh, I think it was, well, it was 2022 now, but Louise was there presenting and she was very gracious. I went and spoke with her in one of the breaks and I was asking her a number of questions. And the thing that impressed me the most was 
not that she was opposed to it for any ideological reason. She said, like, we tried to find whether it would work because we don't really yes. care what we recommend to people as long as it gets better performance, especially as I said, in the yeah. AIS setting where they're trying to get the most performance. And I know they did these studies, particularly with the walkers, and they tried different, you know, different regiments and could this work and could they adapt them? She's like, unfortunately, we tried lots of things and it just didn't seem mm-hmm. to get the result. And we weren't going to keep bashing our head against the wall to show a negative result over and over and over. Once you do it a few times, you realize, okay, this is probably the consistent result we're going to get. And I thought that was impressive in the sense that even though a lot of the research she had done in the past said the opposite, she was still willing to very heavily explore it in a very systematic fashion. I thought that's how it actually should be done. It was was very impressive. And and you make a good point there. And obviously she made a few good points. I'll give her credit there. And as you say, you know, uh, she was based at the Australian Institute of Sport then. Academics and publications and that sort of thing and all the metrics that we're <laughs> madly concerned with these days didn't affect her. Her job was to win gold medals. So, yeah. again, if there was a chance, a slim chance that this would work, and I guess the one thing here is that, you know, getting down to a little bit more technical and physiology, we had very, very high rates of fat oxidation in our studies after fat adaptation. But it didn't matter. You don't win gold medals because you've got, you know, high rates of fat oxidation. It, it, it just doesn't work. So, you know, Tim's been harking on about this for ages and ages. Maybe Hawaiian Ironman and ultra distance events. But remember, we did studies up to four, five hours with elite cyclists. And as a good subjects where the coefficient yeah. of variation for their performance is very small. So if there was a benefit, we would have picked it up. We haven't. And I think we're down to it eight, nine, ten studies now. So that for me is, you know, door shut, pretty convincing, as she wrote in a in an editorial once, it's the nail in the coffin. And I and mm. I think it is. There may be individuals who still do that, who still believe in it. Um, but there are individuals who rock up to the lab here and say they're on the ketogenic diet and you look at their diet with the dietitian and they you know by lunchtime they've had about four hundred grams of carbohydrate. Yeah. They're just, you know, <laughs> So what they say they're eating and what they're actually eating and what they think they're eating and what they propagate out there in the world, and even elite athletes do this, is completely wrong. Sorry, I think we might have lost you there for a second. You did freeze for 10 seconds. I'm back. Um, That's all right. What was the last point that you were just making there, there, John? So the fact that, you know, athletes often come into the lab and tell us, you know, I'm on the ketogenic diet and I'll ask them to do a diet recall with our dietitians. And as I said, by by lunchtime on the first day, we figured they had 400 grams of carbohydrates. So again, even in the elite circles, what athletes and top athletes tell you they're eating and what they're actually eating are two completely different things. But the belief system in the ketogenic diet is is out of all proportion. And again, I challenge anyone in events less than three hours to perform optimally on a high fat ketogenic diet. Given that, is there obviously you do research also for health and in areas of health like mm-hmm. diabetes, is there any benefit yep. to having a diet that is lower in carbohydrates and higher in say fat intake for other populations, not athletic populations? Yep, good, very good point. And, and the answer to that is yes, obviously, if you look at people with insulin resistance, uh, a precursor to type 2 diabetes, where their blood glucose control is is particularly poor, then anytime you eliminate particularly the, the carbohydrates that have a high glycemic response, the better blood glucose control is. And I guess one thing here, it's a good bridge into an area which we have got a lot of uh, expertise and we're currently uh, researching extensively this issue of time restricted eating yeah um if we just want if we just want to go there for, for course, a couple of minutes great. i mean what what we now think is you know we've 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 really pushed what we should be eating for an awful long time so we know the what we know the the macronutrient composition to a certain extent and as you pointed out there it does differ with different populations but the when is very important and only recently have we begun to sort of appreciate with a with a bit of background in circadian biology that when you eat is important and here uh, again for your listeners time restricted eating is simply where we say to largely unhealthy populations with some metabolic disorders let's bring the window over which you eat your food 
into a smaller window. So typically we try and reduce that window, particularly with some of our overweight obese subjects. We find their eating window, which is the time between their first energy intake and their last energy intake in the evening, can be 14, 15 hours. So, you know, they're snacking after dinner. Yeah, all day. They're going to yeah. bed. We are basically all day grazing, we call it. And they go to bed uh, having eaten, you know, perhaps an hour and a half before. Glucose just stays elevated postprandially throughout the night. And it's not until we have these continuous glucose monitors that we can actually see what happened nocturnally. And we now know that when you bring your eating window, in particular that last meal of the, the evening, to perhaps 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, your nocturnal glucose profile is profoundly altered and is profoundly better. So mm. we've done a lot of work on that now. And I guess the literature in nutrition and the dietitians and the nutritionists has, have been, if you like, not pushing, but the emphasis has been on what to eat. We now think that when to eat is very important as well. I know we put this in the questions in the preparation, but is that different to calorie restriction? Um, I know that one of the initial theories that came out was, oh, you people lose weight because they're not eating as much, you know, if they only eat in a four or six hour or eight hour window. Yeah. I don't know whether that's true or not. You can, you can explain that, but does that make a difference to just having mm. lower calories? Because obviously there's also associations and these might be tenuous. You can, you can correct me, but on, you know, things like longevity with, you know, long-term calorie restriction or um, potentially things yep. like time-restricted eating? Yep. A lot of questions in there. Um, firstly, I didn't even read the questions that you sent me. I didn't do my homework, so sorry, okay. guys, but I much, pre much prefer to ad-lib. We seem to be going all right here. Yeah. So look, let, let's, let's just make a few definitions here. Time-restricted eating, very simply, where you reduce the intake window uh, from perhaps 10, uh, sorry, from perhaps 14, 15 hours to, to 8 or 10, if you can, with no caveat that we tell the person not to eat x y or z mm. so it's it's again it's ad lib eating but in the in the window chronic energy restriction where we typically reduce energy intake from you know around 25 percent for prolonged periods is another way and i'll get onto that in a second and then the intermittent fasting you know the five plus two and there's various permutations on all this there's only time restricted eating which plays off chronobiology yeah. and by that i mean that that sets the circadian rhythm when you're eating in normal eating times. The others are restricting it. And when you restrict mm. calories, as you've correctly pointed out, particularly if you're a mouse or a house fly, you live longer. Yeah. Now, here, I like that you put that in, that if you're a, well, <laughs> you're a mouse. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, we've got to be careful at, you know, casting aspersions on some of the animal studies. But the point is here if you ask me now, is it important or do I want to live to 120? The answer is no. Longevity isn't my goal. Health span is much more important. Mm. And I think here we've got to remember all these energy restricted diets may in other animal models and such like prolong life, but do they actually increase the quality of life? And that's a very important point. The other thing just very quickly is on these calorie restricted diets, whether it's intermittent fasting or chronic energy restriction, yes, you lose a kilogram or whatever it happens to be, but for every kilogram you lose, you're losing three or 400 grams of muscle mass. Yeah, that seems and to be that, a major issue. Yeah. It is a major issue because as you get older, you guys are still like young enough, but once you hit, you know, the 40s, to hold on to your muscle mass is very, very difficult. And that's even if you're like us and you're training every day and keeping fit and healthy. For the average population, as you know, you know, sarcopenia, the age-related loss of muscle mass is a major problem. So again, from a functional point of view, I hate scale weight. In fact, when we tell our subjects, we DEXA them, we look at their body composition, I say, I don't care what the scales weigh. I'm more concerned with the ratio of your body fat to your lean muscle mass because it's your lean muscle mass which has a better prognosis for metabolic disease and functional living. Yeah. In, in terms of, of that then, what are the key separators? Is you know maintaining, say, muscle mass one of the key separators between that time-restricted eating and something like the calories? And also, can you talk, is there a difference between the intermittent fasting? Um, does that present differently with what it does physiologically? Well, look, we've got, um, giving you a sneak preview, we've got a study that's just uh, actually in press, I think, at the moment. We've looked at the three different diets and looked at their effect on measuring uh, via traces muscle protein synthesis. 
And in the short term, you know, there's the usual declines in muscle protein synthesis that we get. In fact, we did a study many, many years ago in highly trained subjects at the Australian Institute of Sport. And when we restricted their energy intake by as little as 500 kilocalories a day, we got a 20% reduction in basal protein synthesis. Now, that's the bad news. Mm. The good news is that exercise stimulates protein synthesis, as you know, and can rescue that effect almost 100%. So when you talk about the time-restricted eating, we do have a paper in cell metabolism, which we did with the the Norwegian group. And when we look at time-restricted eating plus exercise, there is an additive effect. And of course, the effects on muscle mass were much better. In other words, the preservation of muscle mass than just time-restricted eating alone. Because again, with the time-restricted eating, although we only tell people to reduce their eating window, because they're eating over fewer hours in a day, they generally tend to actually eat less. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned sport there and, and some of the work that you have looked at. Is there recommendation for athletes to be using these kind of eating windows or is that dangerous? Because most of, I don't know if Jack gave you any background, but I coach track and field sprint athletes um, at a reasonably high level. How do you go to you know make Australian teams? And all of the nutritional advice we've got from diet, you know, sports dietitians is, you know, that they eat particular across a relatively large window and they actually kind of ask them to graze across the day, have, you know, morning tea, have afternoon snack, have pre-training, have post-training. Is that the right recommendation from what you're seeing? Is that evolving or is that pretty set in stone? It's not preset in stone, and you said sport, which of course encompasses everything from yeah, you know, running sorry, 100 that, that, meters right up to for you. no, no, but no, no. I'm going to turn it back round and say sprinters because I actually was a reasonable 400 meter runner, 48.6 seconds uh, for 400 That's as a, a nice junior. That's a humble so brag there, mate. <laughs> not, not too, sh- not, not too shabby there. Very still, good. still the fastest. Still, still the fastest person I've had. I've never had a student faster than me, but um, that's another thing. I'm not that fast these days. Down. <laughs> so the point there is, you know, for your sprinters there, and I mean this in a in a kind and generous way, the use of muscle glycogen during their training sessions is not as extensive as you might think. It's very high intensity, so there's a high turnover of ATP creatine phosphate. But I would strongly suggest that unless you're doing very long ish sprint sessions that glycogen depletion isn't the problem yeah um therefore you know to to keep pouring in carbohydrate before during after grazing throughout um so long as i guess they're at the weight that you require them to be and i guess that's the power to weight thing that we probably need to discuss i'm going to take this recording john and take it to some of the dietitians i work because i've been arguing with (laughs) them and they think i'm an idiot and obviously it's not my area I'm, I'm i'm a physio but I keep saying to them, I don't think sprinters need this much carbohydrate intake. You're making my athletes fat. And they, they go, you can't talk like that. And I say, well, you know, fat doesn't fly. You know that. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. Look, 100%. I mean, again, as, as an ex, I guess 400 is not really a sprinter. But it is a sprint. I used to look definitely at the sprinters. Sprint. Well, it definitely is a sprint, a longer sprint, if you want to call it that. But I remember going to, you know, when I was in the States, I was on an athletic scholarship there and looking at the sprinters and, I was with the middle distance squad then and we used to go out, you know, warm up 5K, come back to a track session and the sprinters are still putting their blocks in. And I'm thinking, yeah. well, what what the heck are they doing? When they talking. work, they work very hard. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, talking, well, t- talking and stretching, which I'm not too sure the stretching works either, but that's another topic. So uh, I am we'll, complete- we'll dispute you on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, it, high permeability, show me a study where it increases performance. Uh, we, had, we, had David, the- we had David Bem on. He, he'd argue with you as well. Do you know David? I do, yes, yes. No, yeah. I, my my stance on that though is that if you've got the mobility required for the sport, then hyper mobility doesn't increase performance. Show me well, the study. That's true, but there's a there's a pretty big <laughs> variation between hypo and hyper. Yeah, oh, yeah. hypo, yeah, that, but that's not the range of motion you require for the sport. You're hypo, so you're less than. So my definition's correct. <laughs> i'll accept that i'll accept that all right but the carbohydrate going back to that i i am completely with you if you look at the energetic demands of a typical sprint session why wouldn't a normal diet of four to five grams per kilogram body must be adequate 
Mm. I, I can't see why you'd need seven or eight, as you say. Yeah. What are you going to do with that? It, you don't need the extra weight. You want power to weight ratio in a sprinter. You don't want excess mass. Can I ask you then, because I've been trying to look for it and I can't find research and it's probably my lack of um, searching skills, but I keep asking some of the dietitians that we work with and no one seems to have really clear data on this, which is <laughs> are there nutritional inputs for speed power athletes that may be not necessarily related to the macro, but more the micro that might be useful. Like, or maybe non-essential amino acids too. So yeah, but essential amino acids. There's obviously it's a like speed power is you know is a very brain driven task. That there is a lot mm. of neurological strain that happens with your brain coordinating what you're doing. Are there any or is there any research that suggests that in those speed power events you should be eating certain things? Um, to really amplify the nutrition nutritional requirements for that. Or and I'd even add to that too, of thinking about some of the physiological differences between having a larger type 2 fiber typology compared to a more slow twitch fiber typology. Yep, yep. No, I'm with you. All right. So in answer to the first question, you better get my wife on here and she can answer the nutritional considerations in all seriousness look there are there are some IOC consensus statements on you know requirements for for sprint athletes and the such like so you know if you PubMed Louise Burke or Trent Stellingworth or a few people like this you might um you might get some joy there uh, as far as what you said about the fiber depletion that that's a that's a good point and you know the sprinters essentially we know they've obviously they wouldn't be sprinters if they didn't have a predominance of fast twitch fibers but when we talk back and it gets back to your your glycogen question there or your carbohydrate needs for the sprinters question you know it may be that sprinters do deplete fiber specific patterns uh, and there's you know when we biopsy them and we look at a mixed muscle there's still plenty of glycogen left so i'm not disputing the fact that you know in certain populations fast twitch fibers for example there may be massive glycogen depletion. But again, you know, your normal diet would replete those sort of fibers fairly, fairly quickly within 36 hours. So, and again, I'm not suggesting that every session is easy, but there's obviously periodization within a sprint program where you're going to do very high intensity work, neurological demands, recruitment demands are different to some of the, I guess, the more uh, easy days, we'll call them, where you're still obviously, you know, sprinting or in the gym doing power strength activities. But again, the need for glycogen isn't huge, especially when you're in the gym. I mean, I'll give you the classic case here. I've done, you know, I travel a lot. I'm on the road a lot. And I'm in hotels and lots of gyms. And occasionally I see the odd athlete. But for the most part, I see recreational people in the gym and they've got their bottle of sports drink, which will remain nameless. And they're on the bike at, you know, 55 watts, which is something, you know, most of us could do with our arms. They do 12 or 15 minutes of exercise. And I look at the bottle, I think you've just had 600 mils of a 7.2% concentration drink. You know, you've had 40 grams of carbohydrate. You've you've not even, you know, carbohydrate, X number of calories per gram. You've not even burnt anywhere near that. So you're actually going out of the gym in positive energy balance. Mm. And, And I think this is the problem. I think the and I'm not knocking it again, but the sports drink manufacturing and marketing departments have been so successful that every athlete after every occasion thinks they need a bottle of XYZ with electrolytes and carbohydrate when they definitely do not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good to hear you say that because I think that even the athletes that I deal with now, they have these entrenched ideas and it's mostly, I think, been driven by marketing more than, than yeah. clear, clear scientific understanding. And athletes, again, you've got to remember this, guys, that the athletes are no different to the to the man or woman in the street. They want a quick fix. They're looking for the next magic bullet and, you know, taking it right back to the ketogenic diet. You know, a few athletes started claiming this and then all of a sudden, you know, athletes were all over this because they will try anything. The, the thing that amazes me is, you know, we, we see quite a few triathletes who are generally as far as education goes, very well read. They can quote your Journal of Applied Physiology articles. They'll spend, you know, $10,000 on their bikes and 2000 on a disc wheel. Yet some of their nutritional practices leave an awful lot to be desired, let alone their training practices. And you think, well, you know, maybe spend less on the bike and get some more science into you there. And again, they're the, they're the most educated of, of the athletic populations that we deal with. So often it's just a case of following, you know, a successful 
athlete who does X, Y, and Z. It's got nothing to do with X, Y, and Z. It's got everything to do with their genetics. Hmm. Uh, sorry to, to go back to it, but in, and again, this is very selfish, but in, in a sprint athlete, would something like time-restricted eating be dangerous or would it be something that they could use because their, as you said, their intake may not need to be excessive due to their, say, glycogen demands? <laughs> Look, that depends on their training. If they're if they're top level athletes, like you say, you're coaching, you know, they probably are training twice a day, at least some days of the week. I can't see any advantage in time restricted eating there. What I can see is there that what you're eating, the composition of the diet is probably more important than the timing, to be completely honest. Now, yeah. in the case of endurance athletes, and again, the triathletes are a good example. Typically, they'll swim in the morning. They'll at least do a, another session in the afternoon and evening. And sometimes it's after work for those who aren't semi-professional. Again, time-restricted eating is not what you want. They want to replenish in carbohydrate and glycogen as much as they can. So in the athletic population, and there are a couple of studies out there in athletes on time-restricted eating, it doesn't generally enhance performance. It does reduce body fat slightly, which, again, in most sports is advantageous. Yeah. Is there a role, John, with time-restricted e- eating to help in recovery? Like I'm thinking about the upregulation of something like autophagy. Is, that, is there any evidence to suggest that that can actually support the healing process following training? That's a good question. I'm trying to think of direct evidence uh, of a study that's actually looked at that. And off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Um, again, I think we go back to the basic nutritional guidelines of no matter whether it's strength or power or endurance, that golden window of three hours after exercise is always very, very important. I think as long as you've got those bases covered, you know, maybe TRE may be good. You know, I I know the dietitians use it sometimes when athletes have to make weight. And that's probably one example where it may be very beneficial. And again, you've got to remember the athlete is a fine, you know, it's a highly tuned fine automobile, which my analogy is always to the students. It's like putting a car in the garage. The sedentary person turns the key off and walks out and the car's not doing anything. The athlete is different. You take the key out and they're still turning over in sort of first gear. They're still metabolizing fuel. Their resting metabolic rate is still higher. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration. I can't really give you a, a, a blanket answer to that question, but there are a couple of studies that I'm happy to point to you with a look of time-restricted eating in athletes, not improved performance or training adaptation at all. So I'm not sure of the direct answer to your autophagy question because I don't mm. think anyone's actually looked at that. But it's a good question, though. Well, you know, we speak about this a bit because obviously, especially when someone gets injured, is there benefit to enhancing that kind of process because this discussion... Mm. And, and again, whether this is backed up or not, but, you know, of time-restricted eating having effects on the inflammatory process um, systemically and, and whether yeah. that has any influence on, you know, healing or recovery of, say, someone has a muscle strain or something like that. Can you use that mm-hmm. in those periods as some sort of tool? I have seen some evidence coming out now. I'm pretty sure it might be in animal models of looking at using fasting following, say, surgery. Um, yeah. But, uh, in terms of the quality of the evidence or its application to human participants, I'm actually not exactly sure. But it's a well. Fa- clearly- let's sorry. Let's yep. take your example of fasting after surgery. I mean, one of the major things in after surgery is usually you know people have a period of best bed rest or inactivity, mm. and the point there is any time you do that, you have reduced protein synthesis. So. <laughs> Post-surgery, I'd be getting in as much protein as I could and moving as much as I could to stimulate the muscle. So again, Mm -hmm. it's horses for courses. It depends on the individual situation. Back to your other question there, one of the things um, we haven't touched upon, but we sort of have indirectly, you know, when we talk about the high fat diets, one of the things that we've been uh, researching historically, and they've got quite a few outputs on this, is is the low-carbohydrate diet. And I'm going to go back to your rehab question because... If you want to facilitate a training adaptation post-injury or whatever it happens to be, I can see a place in there, and we've mentioned this in articles and no one's really picked it up, for training with low carbohydrate yeah. because you're really rehabbing. And if you want to push the training adaptation, and we know from our studies looking at some of the molecular pathways, when you commence training with lower carbohydrate, you do amplify that training adaptation I can see a place for that in rehabilitation, but I, to the best of my knowledge, don't know anyone who's looked at that. When you say amplify that training adaptation, are we talking about more 
around aerobic metabolism and things like developing um, conditioning or are we talking also about yeah upregulation of say the mTOR pathway and developing strength or power attributes good point you pulled me up on that one we've done both studies um mm, donny camera one of my ex postdocs did it on strength training it do not do that it makes no sense <laughs> teleologically or anything else but you don't amplify the training adaptation in fact it's actually worse because the intensity of the training is high high intensity training is glycogen you ain't got much it is very correctly pointed out there an endurance training more aerobic based activity where the training signaling pathways if you like are amplified and you tend to get a better training adaptation so you know let's just say for example if i was injured firstly I'd be doing prehab, which is a physio, you know, you want to go into surgery or whatever with the highest muscle mass, but also you want to come out with the highest muscle mass and training adaptation. You lose adaptations very quickly. And one way to maintain those, I would say, would be to do, if you could, portions of your workout, if you're an aerobic based athlete with lowered muscle glycogen. Yeah, I was actually going to make the point too, when this research I was referring to with using intermittent fasting following surgery was it was for uh, i think a rotator cuff tear so it was relatively yeah, minor right. surgery in terms of and it was a yeah. short window for which, which they did it because i would definitely agree you don't want to be doing prolonged fasting where you're going to influence muscle protein synthesis yeah yeah look yeah. and I'll, I'll talk generically here but you know the hospitals aren't great at post-operative nutritional care yeah, for the yeah, most part not i mean jelly. yeah yeah <laughs> you know, I went in for a label tear once, and you know, got coleslaw and jelly, and I'm thinking, just get me out of this place. <laughs> well, was there gelatin in the jelly at least, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it had some collagen in there, slide it in there. But um, yeah, it's not the best nutrition in the world. <laughs> you know, thinking about your your career and your research, John, have your recommendations about exercise nutrition changed over time? Then too. I think they've evolved. And I guess one of the things I'd make the point here is that scientists, and we've written this in several articles, we often come along and validate what athletes have been doing in the field for a long while. And I'll give you an example here. I was fortunate enough to be at a conference in Switzerland. Oh, it's probably seven or eight years ago now. And Frank Shorter, the US Olympic marathon Marathon. gold medalist in 1976, uh, Sorry, 72, he won. 76, he was second to an East German who later confessed to to doping. So he really would have had two gold medals. And it was the time that we'd published one of our training with low glycogen studies. And I spent about five minutes telling him all this in, you know, layman's terms, so to speak, although he's highly intelligent. And he said, "Uh, John, let me just tell you what I used to do. And he literally, I'll be very succinct here. He said, on a Saturday afternoon, I'd go out and run 2800s or do whatever to really deliberately lower my muscle glycogen. He said I'd eat low carbohydrate that evening, high fat, high protein. I would deliberately go out on my Sunday long run, which in his cases was 15 to 20 mile at around 5.30 minute per mile pace. And he said, I would train low. He said, is that what you were doing? Is that what you've done in the lab? And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, he's done it. And the other example, of course, as you probably know, is he drank defist Coke in the 1972 marathon. And it was one of my mentors, David Costill, who two years later in the laboratory showed that caffeine had an ergogenic effect on endurance performance. So there's two examples from one athlete who was just way ahead. He trained low and he drank caffeine. <laughs> do you still try to <laughs> so, do that? Yeah, we often come along and give it a tip. I was going to ask, John, do Go you ahead. still now try to collaborate with clinicians, coaches in the field to really try and understand what people are doing in the real world because it seems Most that you can often get a there, bit of a disconnect between what researchers are doing and thinking. we'll have to edit this. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Neck. You got me back now, John? Okay, you broke up. Start the, you, you, you can edit this. Yeah, you. I just got the tail end of the question. If you'd like to repeat that. Oh, good. I was just going to ask, do you still try to collaborate with coaches and athletes who are trying to push and um, try different things within the real world because there often can be that disconnect between what researchers are doing and thinking within the research lab versus what people are doing in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And a, and a really spot on question. And I think if you're not doing that, you're really not a sports scientist, to be completely honest, number one. Number two is that most of the studies that we've done, and certainly those in association with the Australian Institute of Sport, For example, when we used to have to apply for a grant to get the study done, it used to have coach sign-off. It had to have 
coach sign off. That is so important. If the coach thought this was a load of rubbish, the chances are it probably was a load of rubbish. Now you might say, well, that stifles innovation. And, you know, there are many things that can happen in the lab, which, you know, the coach or the athlete wasn't aware of. It's give and take. But yeah, back to your question, coaches input is vital. And I'll give you one example very, very quickly from a study that we published way, way back in Cape Town. We looked at different interval training protocols in endurance trained athletes. And we looked at the output, if you like, the primary outcome variable was a 40 kilometer time trial in elite cyclists, which takes around an hour. Now we gave them intervals, which were very specific at race pace, you know, 10 minute reps, four of them or whatever it was, blah, blah, blah. We also mixed it up again. And this was a study that Will Hopkins was on. We bring him back to life here. We also gave very short, high intensity bursts of exercise at like 150% of your maximal power. So this will be 600, 800 watts for these guys, which was way above the wattage or power output that they raced at. And guess what? Both the event specific intervals, but also the short intervals, which you know had nothing to do with the race, improved performance, indicating that there are probably more than one ways to skin a cat. There are more than one mechanisms which improve performance. And I always remember that study because the coach said, we do these high intensity bursts. We go out for our long rides, but we'll put a maximal effort in for 20 or 30 seconds, maximal effort. And I said, well, you know, that's great. And, you know, it's good for stage races, but for 40K time trial, that's not how you race. He said, oh, I don't care because it improves performance. And he was right completely right so if you go back yeah. and look at that study you'll see that you know we were had we not listened to him we wouldn't have even included that group in the study and we would never have got that result do you see the importance of applying that similar type of nuanced individualized approach which nutrition with nutrition as well like obviously when i think of research it gives us indications of what happens at a group level that I've lost you again that's all right can you see me now john I can, yeah, I can see you, but then it just, you, it, the vocals just go. So ah. it, I, I, you can edit this, obviously. Start the question again, I'll answer it again. Sorry, I, sure, I only sure. got a quarter of that. No, I was just going to ask, do you apply that similar nuanced approach with nutrition to athletes? Because when I think about research, it gives us an indication of the overall average. Yeah, look, every, we look at every each athlete individual, is, we do is see different slight variation and, in you terms know, Okay, up we got a real, we, sorry, we got a real disconnect here. I don't know what's happening because I'm sitting in the office and not moving. And it's probably on our end, mate. Don't stress. I'd say we can hear you fine, John. And okay, the disruption. All right, sorry. I, again, I, I, I didn't hear the question. I'll, I'll, I'll abbreviate take, it more quickly. Do you take a nuanced take, approach? Take three. To, yeah, yeah. Do you take a nuanced <laughs> approach to how you apply nutrition with athletes as well, where you do have to see you do see variation and an importance of individuality. Yeah, I, I think we do. And I mean, you know, as coaches uh, and working with athletes, you guys would know that every athlete is different and an individual and, you know, people respond to different training interventions or different nutritional interventions. So I think it's very important to, you know, we talk about periodizing training, but periodizing nutrition and individualizing nutrition. I mean, in medicine at the moment, we've got this whole thing about, you know, personalized medicine. Can we give certain things to certain people and this, that, and the other. And I think the same is true in athletics. In fact, I think the athletics has probably led the medicine. Personalized medicine has come along a lot later than, you know, personalized nutrition or personalized training. And the issue of responders and non-responders is another one. I don't like the term non-responder because mm -hmm. I've never seen someone who's not responded to a treatment we've given them. They respond less. But again, the way we do science is to, you know, do 10 or 12 or 15 subjects and look at the average you as a as a coach for your sprinters aren't concerned with the average you want to know what works for your sprinter and that's why individual results and personalization is very very important mm -hmm. just thinking about time yeah, yeah of course we might we might not take any more of your time there john but thank you so much for sharing your knowledge uh we very much that's so all right appreciate that's fine it. Um, no that's will, that's fine that we will uh definitely be reaching out to louise so uh send her a, a warning <laughs> Yeah. No, look, she'll, she'll, she'll do it. She's, she's as busy as I am, but you know, these, these things are good to just get information out and science. So you guys are doing a good job. No, so appreciate keep it. it up. They're good questions, actually. Sorry. We didn't get through the whole lot of questions, but no, as I said, okay. I didn't read them anyway. So it didn't matter. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. Take care.